All good. Uh, we'll do two, six, and two, five. We'll see, but I'm glad. And then only. And open your hymn books to page number 206. We'll sing, Oh, say, but I'm glad. Page number 206, Oh, say, but I'm glad. Page number 206. Page number 206. There is a song in my heart today, something I've never had. Jesus has taken my sins away. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Wonderful, marvelous love he brings into a heart that's sad. Through darkest tunnels a soul just sings. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come in my cups overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. We have a fellowship rich and sweet. Tongues can never relate. Abiding in him the soul's retreat. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Won't you come to him with all your care, weary and worn and sad? You too will sing as his love you share. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. All right, turn to page number 207 if you would. Page number 207, only a sinner. Not have I gotten, but what I received. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride high abased. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. <coughs> My story to God be the glory. Only a sinner saved by grace. Once I was foolish and sin ruled my heart, causing my footsteps from God to depart. Jesus hath found me happy, my case. I now am a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Tears unavailing, no merit had I. Mercy had saved me or else I must die. Sin had alarmed me, fearing God's face, but now I'm a sinner, saved by grace. Only a sinner, saved by grace. Only a sinner, saved by grace.
saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Suffer a sinner whose heart overflows, loving his Savior to tell what he knows. It's more to tell it would I embrace. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story, to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Our Heavenly Father, we are certainly thankful that we're saved and we are saved by grace. Uh, sinners, yes, uh, declared to be the saints of God after salvation. Thank you. Now, Lord, our hearts uh, go out tonight to families that, uh, Lord, we're thinking about moms and dads and grandmas and grandparents of these 19 children that were uh, killed in Texas Elementary School, uh, two teachers, 19 children. Uh, Lord, uh, we lift these families up to you. There's a lot of things we don't understand, and that's one of them. And so, Lord, we just ask you that you would work in these families' hearts and lives, use it for your honor and glory some kind of way, Lord, that they might, Lord, uh, have reason, uh, Lord, to even more trust you. Uh, we thank you for what you accomplish, what you do. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. And, of course, uh, we all are not unaware of what took place. Uh, I guess it was yesterday. Yesterday. And uh, I, uh, I'm saddened that... Uh, the folks who will make, th make this a political issue, uh, Mr. Obama and Mr. Biden, come out immediately and made it a political issue. And uh, the truth is that uh, I, they had guns when I went to school. I remember going to school and the kids at school had shotguns in the back window of their truck pickup trucks and they drove the trucks to school. And had, nobody ever thought about killing anybody. Guns haven't changed. People have. And I don't think it has anything to do with uh, mental illness. I think it has something to do with demon possession. And I wouldn't be surprised that I'm people demon oppressed, demon influenced, even in the, uh, the swamp in Washington, D.C. Anybody that would want to kill unborn babies, why would they be concerned about 19 children being being killed. What, 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 amen? And so, uh, anyway, uh, I am saddened. I was sitting, listening to the news this morning and, and wept as I listened to the news and all that's taking place in our, in our nation. And uh, so, uh, let's uh, pray for them tonight in a special time of season of prayer for the families uh, there. And uh, for our nation, of course, it's, that's also in the bulletin, our nation is. And uh, ask God to give us the wisdom and the understanding to know what to do and how to deal with it, how to help other people. And uh, it's just uh, mind-boggling. It's just overwhelming of what is taking place. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to the book of Job book of Job chapter 2. Next Wednesday, Michael will start take, doing a Wednesday night service. We just know it's going to be a, a crowd's going to build on Wednesday night. So next Wednesday night, he'll start teaching uh, a series of his choice. And, uh, and I know it's going to pick up and grow. Maybe he'll even get his mother to come to church on Wednesday nights. Who knows what might happen? <laughs> oh, she's listening. But anyway... <laughs> I miss her. She's been uh, been under the weather, I guess, for a couple of weeks. I haven't seen her, but uh, anyway, uh, 
pray for those that are sick, and pray for those that are uh, going through whatever they're going through. And uh, so we trust that, uh, we, by the way, we have a, 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 we're building a library next door. I say we are, I'm watching. But Jacob has uh, bought two more shelves today. That little room, when you go into the, uh, uh, act, to the educational building, the office on the left is gonna have books all the way around. I mean, he's got uh, more shelves today. And uh, we've got more books. If you have books you'd like to donate, we don't want any that's written by Jimmy Swaggart or, or um, <laughs> um, any, and we don't, you know, those, those people like that. We, we don't want any of those books. But uh, anyway, uh, if you've got some that you'd like to d dedicate to the library, they're going to be, you can go in there and sit and read. If you want to check one out, I guess that's possible too, isn't it? Yeah, yes. Tomorrow, yeah. Yep. So uh, anyway, that is, uh, he's really doing, a, he worked about every day this week. So he's in there doing, putting them in, uh, the, uh, in some kind of order, but he's putting them in order. So uh, anyway, Job uh, chapter 2, uh, the scripture says in verse number 11, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place. Eliphaz, the uh, uh, Timonite, and uh, Bildad the Shutite, and so far the uh, Naamathite, for they uh, had made uh, an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him uh, not, they lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent uh, every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon the, uh, their uh, heads towards heaven, a sign of humility. And then the Bible says, so they uh, sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. They saw that his grief was very great. Now, these verses introduce us to three of Job's closest friends, and they will uh, be with us all the way through the book of Job until the very last part of the book, uh, the, uh, almost to the very end. And we do not know how long Job had been in his uh, a lowly condition. He had been evidently a while because uh, it had been at least a matter of a month maybe months, uh, for word to have reached uh, his friends to the uh, east and for them to communicate among themselves about it and set a date to meet and travel together to see about their friend. Uh, they actually uh, make uh, the trip and arrive at in Job's presence. Now, the devastating effect, you think about tragedy, you think about the tragedy that's happened in our nation just this week. But the devastating effect of, of uh, tragedy sometimes brings on self-pity and an unduly prolonged, morbid uh, introspection have, uh, it caused Job uh, uh, over a period of time not to, uh, not, and not to abruptly but in verse chapter 3 and verse number 1, it says, After this, uh, uh, verse 1 says, Open Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, in verse 2 and 3, it says, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which I was, it was said, There is a man child conceived. And so you see uh, his... Uh, uh, how this has affected him. He had wished he had never been born and cursed the day that he, he was devastated by this, uh, the taking of his children, the taking of all his possessions. He was devastated by all that happened to him. And the twofold purpose of the friends was to mourn with him, in verse number 11, and to comfort him. Their, their original, uh, you know, you think about these friends, they, they 
didn't do as well in, the other, in other chapters, but uh, originally they had come to comfort him and uh, to show a sincere sympathy to their friend. They actually came to be a help and a comfort to their friend. And Job was going through an uh, extremely uh, difficult time. And uh, I think about uh, folks, uh, you know, I've been uh, talking with, uh, I haven't said much about it, but uh, Sister uh, Patty uh, James this week and Kristen, uh, Kristen's cousin and uh, Patty James's uh, nephew, her brother's son, 32 years old, uh, passed away this past uh, weekend. And uh, they'll be probably going up on Saturday to, to Pennsylvania for the services and all, but so pray for them as they travel. But everybody, uh, of course, uh, responds differently to certain tragedies. And uh, when you have a wedding coming up like Christian does in, uh, in July and a, the, one of your close family members pass away, it kind of can put a damper on those things. And so we're going to lift them up in prayer and ask God and to help us comfort them. And, uh, but the, to the, the loss of his children, they had no idea, what the, Job's friends, of the discussion that would follow, or that uh, they would uh, end up uh, by calling their dear friend uh, a secret sinner and a hypocrite. So they start out doing well and end up not doing so well. And, uh, but uh, think with me for a second, if you will. Just put brain in gear and think with me. Job conquered for the most part. What he was, you see what he was going through. We know what Job went through. But for the most part, when you think about what he conquered, Job had no Bible. There was no Bible. This is the oldest book in the Bible. There was no Bible written. There was no covenant with Job that God had given him, like at Abraham, I'll, I'll give you a promise, and this is what's going to, he had no covenant. He had no Ten Commandments. He had no indwelling Holy Spirit. He had no vision of heaven, and uh, not one verse of written scripture to encourage him. The things that we go to, we take and we go to the Word of God. We go and go to the promises of God. When we're going through stuff, we read the Bible. Job didn't have that. But yet, for the most part, he was very, very uh, successful in his uh, overcoming of uh, what he was going through. And uh, we take comfort in all those things and thank God for those things. Have you ever wondered what to say when you're face to face with another person in pain? Yeah. The, uh, you ever been speechless when uh, speaking to someone who is suffering? Like we read in verse number 13, uh, so they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him. Seven days and seven nights. They were there for sincere reasons. They were there to help their friend. Uh, and sometimes golden, silence can be golden. Like uh, we do sometimes, uh, I do sometimes. I've said some very dumb things when people were in pain. Uh, things like, um, I know just how you feel. You ever, said that, you ever say to someone, I, I, I just know how you feel? No, you don't. No, you don't. You may have been through the exact same thing, but you don't know how they feel. And uh, we say, like, well, I just know, I know exactly how you feel, and I've learned not to say that because I don't know. How about this one? God must have needed him in heaven. Now, God didn't need him in heaven any more than you needed him on earth. Probably. I mean, Mary and Martha lost a brother. They needed him on earth more than God needed him in heaven. And we need people here more than God needs them in heaven. God don't need them in heaven. But we say stuff like that. God told me that he, is, that he is going to heal you. No, he didn't tell you that. God told me he was going to heal you and you everything's going to be all right. No, he didn't tell you that. And uh, you may be impressed in your, in your spirit and your heart that uh, 
uh, that, that God's going to heal them, but God didn't tell you he was going to heal them. There's one that we say sometimes, like, uh, time heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. It heals. Time makes it sometimes a little bit easier. But time doesn't heal all wounds. Some people suffer for years and years and years. Evidently, Job has been going through something for quite a little while. Amen. And uh, how about this one? God must be trying to teach you something. How many times have I said something stupid like that? God must be trying to teach you something. And uh, so, uh, and they feel like they want to teach you something. Amen. <laughs> Uh, okay, and uh, if you do what I did, you'll feel better. Really? Well, what did you do? <laughs> and uh, my Aunt Mildred had the same problem, and here's what she did, okay. Uh, it was a few years ago. In fact, it was on uh, June the 24th of 2011, there was a state trooper that was killed in our county, and the sheriff called and asked if I would go to the sheriff's office and try to help and deal with all these folks of this state trooper who had just been killed up here at the stoplight at the food line. And uh, I was sitting there, and the secretary came in and said, his dad is on the phone and wants to talk to somebody. His dad only had been listening to the news and heard that a state trooper had been killed. He didn't know who the state trooper was, and she handed me the phone. And I said, hello, and he said, this is so-and-so. Was this my son? And I said, if you, that's what I said. If you, if you come in, we'll, he said, was this my son? And I said, Yes. He said, thank you, and hung up. Uh, while I was sitting there, there was people, deputies everywhere, and people coming in, office workers, dispatchers, and all that was coming in. Uh, and a, a lady come in, and she said, as I was talking with people, praying with people, she come in and she said, it could have been worse. I thought, what? He was killed. And, and she said, it could, it could have been worse. He could have lived through it and been a vegetable the rest of his life. He had a head injury. And I thought, that was really encouraging. But when, in a, under pressure sometimes, when people are in pain, we say some pretty stupid stuff. Amen? It's all right to go like this. And so um, it could have been worse. Our maxims and... Uh, our cute sayings in the face of suffering are not only empty, they can be excruciating, if you think about it. Let us resist trying to package people's pain. You know, uh, little uh, uh, cliches don't work when people are in pain. In Job chapter 2, in verses 11, 12, and 13, three friends come to comfort Job. And uh, they do a good job at first. And uh, Job is, uh, uh, they do a good job as being Job's, I guess you call them caregivers. They care, and they're given, given care, caregivers at first. And I think there's some lessons for us here as we look at these three verses that we can learn from what they did and can help us to be able to help others when we see tragedy. I would, I'd hate to think that I was in this little town in Texas right now as a pastor of a church trying to comfort people whose children had been shot, murdered. Moms and dads, brothers and sisters, you take 19 children I you know that's like uh, 38 adult parents and his grandparents, and on both sides, and there's siblings, and there's a lot of people to deal with. There's their close friends, roommates, schoolmates. But uh, in verse number 11, the Bible says, Now when Job's 
three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him. They heard. They, they heard, and we need to hear the hurting. We need to hear them. And uh, they heard about his suffering and were sincerely concerned about doing something to encourage him, to help him, to get him through the situation. Now, when you uh, hear people's suffering, when you listen, by the way, you can't always be able to go, but you can always pray. You can't always ask God, the Lord, to do something in, the, in our, my friend's life, in his family's life. I was praying for these families today. And it, it's, it's heart-wrenching to know that uh, there are people so evil in our society, so evil that they would destroy children's lives for whatever reason, recognition, anger, whatever it is, demon possession, that they would bring so much pain on so many people because they're in pain. Here are the hurting. Also, I see a sacrifice. There was sacrifice in their schedule. But the Bible says that that was come upon him, they came everyone from his own place. They left their homes, they met together, whatever their schedule, whatever was on their schedule to do. I'm sure they had good, you know, fine paying government jobs like we do, you know, and they had, they had all this leave time and cop time and vacation time and all this stuff they could do. Although probably wealthy in many way, but uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, whatever their schedule had on it, there was nothing more important. Every, every, they came everyone from his own place. And they set out from their homes. And it was important to them to help their friend. Sometimes you don't know what to do. You make a phone call, you say, what can I do? How can I help? What do you need me to do? And uh, sometimes people don't want you to do nothing. They want you to leave them alone. That's, that happens all the time. But we are busy people today. We, are, we, do, we do have plans. We do have things going on. But sometimes we just sacrifice our schedule because someone is suffering. Someone's in pain. And uh, they partnered. They come, they come together in a partnership. For they met together, the Bible says in verse 11. They met together and appointed together, an appointment together. It is uh, a good idea to take someone with you when, when you're making visits with people who are in pain. They might be able to think of something better than you would be able to think of. They might be able to say, you know, we just need to be quiet and love on them. But when you go to hear what people are in pain, it's good to have somebody with you to hear of their need. Uh, these three guys went and uh, to hear the need, and they got there. They all, we well, you know what they did. They, they were silent. But it's good to have a partner. It's good to be able to call someone else up and say, hey, let's get together. So-and-so's in extreme pain, or this has happened in our life. And uh, I remember when there was a little boy on 206 uh, hit by a car, killed. And uh, the family, I, I uh, got in my car and went to their home where they lived and sat down with them. And the little boy had just been... Uh, just been killed, and we sat there and we cried with them, we prayed with them, we write verses to them, and uh, sometimes you just have to be quiet. But uh, tragedy in every one of our lives, tragedy is facing us. Today, t tomorrow it could be your life. Tomorrow it could be my life. Uh, suddenly something changes that we don't know anything about. Tragedy, and uh, so uh, they partnered together. And uh, they, they went with grace, and they went with comfort. They went to comfort him. And uh, verse number uh, 11, For they had made an appointment together to come and to mourn with him and to comfort him. 
They went to mourn with him and to comfort him. Now, the goal was to go and to be sympathetic. Sympathetic with him, comfort. Coming alongside of is what it means. They wanted to come alongside of a man who was in having great stress, great distress, great, great uh, trials. And so you have to go with grace, but uh, by the grace of God. I was, uh, a sheriff texted me the other day and about a person that we knew was trying to help. And I texted back and I said, but for the grace of God, that could be me. And, uh, of course, he said something like, uh, yes, I thank God for what he's accomplished in my life and things has changed and this and that. Of how grateful we are that we're, we're not going through anything like that. Many of our wounds are self-inflicted wounds. This wound was not self-inflicted. Job was going along and things was fine. Everything's good. And bam. Uh, everything he owns is gone. Children are all deceased. And uh, all the servants are dead except for a couple of three or four. And so it takes grace to comfort others and not to judge them for what they are. That ends up what's happening, but, but not to judge them for what they're going through. What have you done wrong? Why is God treating you this way? What the, and uh, that's a temptation. But... Uh, when you go to see someone who is in, that you, to comfort them, you can expect a change in their appearance. They may not be the person they was yesterday. In fact, when you look in verse number uh, 12, and when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they uh, lifted up uh, their voice and wept, and they uh, rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon uh, their heads towards heaven. So they sat down with him. Now they saw him and didn't even recognize him. He was in such turmoil, such pain, such suffering, such anguish. And uh, you can't expect people who are going through what Job went through and what sometimes what others are going through to be like it was yesterday. People change when they are hurting. Sometimes we try to help people who are hurting and they are not in, they're not in for us to be able to, uh, wanna, they don't want to help. And they might say some things that be unkind or uh, things you don't expect, you wouldn't expect for them to say. But they are hurting, and when they are hurting, they change. They want to get through this thing as fast as possible. And they may hurt you. But you have to allow for that because they are hurting and so people change when they're hurting. Also, they exhibited uh, their emotions in verse 12. Now, we have to be careful about exhibiting your emotions. <laughs> but uh, the Bible says that, the, that uh, they lifted up their voice and wept. And they rent everyone his mantle, sprinkled the dust upon their heads. And that, that is uh, typical of that day of the... Of, uh, uh, Humility. And so they exhibited this uh, emotion. And so we have to be careful with our emotions, but it's all right to weep out loud. It's all right to weep with people. Sometimes that's better than saying anything. Just hold them, embrace them, and weep with them. And uh, that's what these fellows did. And uh, there is uh, ritualism here. And uh, they uh, tore their robes and sprinkled dust, dust in their hair, which is the custom of that day. It would have been nice if it had a Bible. So now this, is what, now Job, this is what the Bible says right over here. You know, and uh, we know God doesn't make any mistakes. He's too wise to do, too, too wise to do wrong. He's too good to make a mistake. And uh, here's what the Bible says right here. You take comfort in the word of God. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. And, uh, you know, and... Uh, there's some verses here I can give to you, peace, and, and, and but they didn't have that either. 
fact, they had very little to be able to comfort Job with except their friendship. And uh, it was honored with humility, the dust, uh, where the, uh, that's the grace uh, and, uh, of God as they went in to visit with him and to see him or talk to him and to try to uh, comfort him. And uh, I noticed also that they sat with the sufferer. Verse number 13 says, And none spoke a word unto him, for they uh, saw that his grief was great. They sat down, verse 14, they sat down with him upon the ground. They sat down, he was sitting on the ground. And uh, they got down to his level, so to speak. And uh, they got as close as possible. I don't know how close possible it is, but you can be able to, when you're working with folks, deal with as close as possible. How close do I need to get? How close can I get? Will it be uncomfortable? But take the time needed to do what needs to be done. They took the time needed. They were in no hurry to leave, verse 13. Seven days and seven nights they sat with Job. Seven days and seven, now there's a friend. Seven days and seven nights. Now, now it is important not to overstay our welcome. You know, I'm sure I've done that over the years. I'm sure there's been times people will say, Preacher, would you just go home, please? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Amen. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, there are folks uh, that want you to stay and never leave. There are folks that don't want you to come at all. Five minutes is good, you know, and uh, have a word of prayer and get out of the way. Uh, but uh, never tr uh, overstay your welcome. And, uh, but that has to be something decided between you and the Lord, your heart and them, and how long to stay. But, but when you leave, people need to know that you're available, not just passing words around, but you are available. You need me, you call me, and I will be here. My uh, children, John and Bill and Tracy and their spouses, uh, bought for their mother a Christmas present. And it starts Sunday night. And they got her a place in North Carolina, down on the beach. Down Where are we going? Corolla, and they rent a six-bedroom house. They paid for it and give it to their mother, not their dad, their mother for Christmas. Because they knew that all of us have to go. Because dad may get a phone call, and mama would be in North Carolina alone. So they got everybody got a place. So if somebody dies next week and somebody, something happens and I get the phone call, then Mama will be down there with her children, which she'll probably enjoy the vacation better anyway if I'm not there. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm warning you ahead of time, unless it's a dire emergency, please. Secretary, uh, don't, don't call me unless this is a real emergency. And it could happen. I could have to come home. And uh, I'm praying that won't happen. But uh, in fact, Emma told me one day, I told her I was going away for a couple of days, and she says, you can't go anywhere. I said, what do you mean I can't go anywhere? I'm, I'm the boss, you're the secretary. What do you mean I can't go anywhere? She said, somebody will die. You can't go nowhere. And that's awful to have a reputation every time you leave town and somebody passes away, but I, that is, seems to be my record. And, uh, but uh, this time it's not going to happen. Be silent in the face of suffering. No one said a word. Imagine that. Seven days and seven nights. For they saw that his grief was very great. Show up and shut up, I guess is the terminology there. Silence is golden. 
Sometimes it's just better we don't have anything to say at all than to say something wrong. And we don't have, and I don't have, all the answers to people's pain. Now, if you'll notice, over in the book of Luke, Luke's gospel, chapter number 10, Luke chapter number 10, there's a story, an illustration, true story, Jesus told it, it's a true story, and verse number, chapter number 10 and verse number uh, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit the eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? Now we know the story of the Good Samaritan. That's what this is about. And uh, an insincere lawyer tested Jesus by asking him a dishonest question, tempted him. The lawyer was religious, but he had uh, no relationship, no fellowship, no nothing, no anything with the Savior. He knew something about the law of God, but had no life in his own heart. He knew the law, or something about the law, and uh, plenty of us know that. But this parable of the Good Samaritan is a story of criminal inhumanity. We see this week criminal inhumanity. Verse 30 says that they beat him up. Jesus answered, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, uh, which stripped him and of his raiment and wounded him and... uh, Departed, leaving him half dead. Uh, We're talking about uh, criminal inhumanity. And uh, you think about this picture of of, uh, of humanity going away from God, uh, robbed and beaten up by the devil. And uh, we're living in a time where where we understand that that people do not understand. You can tell them and tell them and tell them and they don't understand. But he would, we, a lost man is going away from God, beaten up, he's dead in trespasses and sins. And it's a story of uh, a, a casual indifference in verse 31, the priest and the, uh, who goes by. Uh, he represents religion uh, with, a, uh, with its rituals and rules. But religion can't do anything to help a man. And religion can't do anything to help a man who is suffering. And the parable is a story of uh, compassionate involvement in verses 33 through 35. It's a picture of Jesus. And verse 33, the Bible says, But a certain Samaritan, as he uh, journeyed, came where he was. There's compassion. And when he saw him, same thing that uh, uh, Job's friends did, he had compassion on him. There it is again. And he went to him, and went to him, and he said, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to uh, an inn, and took care of him. Compassion. And on the morrow, when he uh, departed, he took uh, out two pence, and gave them to uh, the host, and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever uh, thou uh, spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee I will repay thee Jesus has genuine compassion in verse 33 we need to be real we need to understand that people hurt because one day we're going to hurt and we need we need to be able to help people we need to have compassion on people who are hurting our friends especially Jesus has a gracious compassion. He put him on his own beast. He took care of him. He bound up his wounds. 
Uh, it's a picture of, uh, of uh, helping someone who's down. Half dead. It's also a picture of going to the, to the lost. And Jesus has gentle compassion in verse 34. And he went to him, bound up his wounds, put him on his own beast, carried him to an inn, took care of him. There are, when we think about church, there are people who need our help. There are people who are going to go through something. I, um, years ago, went through the book of Job, verse by verse, a Bible study on Sunday night or Wednesday night, years and years ago, and I said, I'll never do that again. <laughs> it seemed like everything we was teaching was, was going through it. But uh, the truth of the matter is, we need to be alert. We need to be compassionate. We need to understand. We need to be ready to help those who are in need, not be critical and use the law and judge them and that sort of thing. And we do that. God forgive us, and he has. But take the time, take the time needed to help others. Now, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what Mike and I were talking yesterday about the church and May not be long before then. Won't be meet when we meet in buildings. Uh, be underground, four, five, ten, six, eight, ten people to, together at a time. We won't be able to gather like this because it'll be illegal. Uh, I don't know how long we got, but we're going to need each other, and we need to encourage each other. And there's times coming where we're going to you're going to lose a loved one. I'm going to lose a loved one. There's going to come a time, but my wife's going to need encouraging because I'm going to go to heaven. First, I've already talked to God about that, amen. <laughs> and uh, because she can go along better without than I can get along without her. But uh, there's going to be great needs. And uh, we want to encourage you to encourage each other. And uh, when you think about what Job said in chapter 3, you know he's hurting. After this, in verse 1, I opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. Wish I'd never been born. But God's got you here, wrote Job. You're here. Now, if you ask me to explain to you why God allowed all that to happen to Job, I can't. If you ask me to explain to you why the Lord would allow 19 children to be shot by a, a demon-possessed 18-year-old, could he have stopped it? Well, we know we could have. But then if he stopped that one, then he'd have to stop all the other sin and stop this and stop that and stop. He'd have to do, he'd have to do all, the, all of it. And he'd have to go all the way back to Calvary. He'd have to stop that. If he stopped Calvary, then where would we be? Be lost. And so uh, God made it perfect. We've messed it up. But men are wicked. And they do wicked things. How does, it, how, does it make you, how does it make you feel to know? And I know you say I couldn't do that. But how does it make you feel to know there's nothing wicked that can be done that you can't are not capable of doing? That's right. There's nothing wicked that can be done that you and I are not capable of doing. It's all about choices. And uh, some people have softer hearts than others. I understand. And I could never do that. And I understand. But you have been put in a position. So uh, when we think about uh, Job, we think about what he went through, we think about his, his sorrow. And, and let the day perish wherein I was born. And the night in which I was said, there is a man child conceived. You see, he knew there was a God because no one else would have known it was a man-child conceived but God. And this time, he didn't know it was a man-child until it was born. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so, yes, God's in control. One of the reasons I don't believe in hyper-Calvinism, I heard a guy use 1 John 1, 12 and 13 yesterday to prove election not by the will of man, not by man's will that he saved. 
Man don't have a will. He really messed up that verse, take it out of context. But if, 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 I, if Calvinism was true, then, if God is in, then God is in control of everything, every event. Nothing happens that God don't know about, but if God's in control, then God's the author of sin. He's, a, he's making sin happen, and that's not happening. Anyway, don't be sidetracked. We're going to pray tonight and ask God to work in these families' lives. Maybe on Sunday we'll have all the 19 names of the kids, and maybe we'll call them out on Memorial Day, mention each child, their family. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, saying some things about my dad on Sunday. I have a lot of paper articles about my father. Uh, Martinsville Bulletin that said uh, first, he was the first man in Martinsville, Virginia, to be missing in action back in 1950, whatever it was, one. And uh, there's paper article, not the paper article, where he was come back from the war, 85 pounds. And uh, uh, my dad was a great soldier. And uh, Sergeant First Class LeVan G. Davis, prisoner of wars. He has uh, I have an article from Roanoke Times where he was a prisoner in World War II. And according to when I preached his funeral, he was a, pri he was a prisoner in the in, war, in the Korean War for three years and a month. And uh, he was in that Korean death march and all that. He wasn't a young man then, but uh, he made it through. And um, according to my grandma Davis, who I never met, that I remembered, uh, he was, it was her prayers that got him through. Amen. Thank God. Now, one of the problems I have with dealing with people who have loved ones who have passed is I, I, I don't want to become insensitive to it. I have preached a thousand funerals. And sometimes you become, why are you so upset, you know? You become insensitive. I've preached my mother's funeral, my father's funeral. I've preached my, my sister's funeral and brother's funeral. And I've preached my uncle's and my aunt's funerals. And I've preached my best friend's and this world's funerals. And, uh, If I'm not careful, I can become insensitive to people's needs, and you want to be sensitive. Although, at all of them, I usually weep uh, because I understand. As I say, you're not to say, I understand. I don't understand. But I understand my feelings and how that uh, if we're not careful, we would become insensitive to people's needs until it gets close to our house. Then we get close to our house, all of a sudden we are sensitive again. Amen. Father, thank you. We pray tonight as we have prayer time with our with our church family that we go through these prayer requests. We pray for our Wednesday night, Lord, this uh, Wednesday night uh, uh, prayer meeting and Bible study. We pray for God that you would st we see it grow until Lord Jesus comes. We'll thank you for it in that name. We pray again for those uh, families, of those 19 children and two teachers. We pray for our nation. Lord, I know as well as you know, it's not the guns are not the problem. We've always had guns for since the Lord uh, uh, Revolutionary War. <laughs> we had guns from before, but Lord, uh, the problem is man, his heart, to do evil. We ask your blessings on this service as we pray for others tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You that are watching at home, are we still on the air, Brother Jacob? Uh, you that are watching from home or wherever, uh, we appreciate you being with us tonight. We love you. Thank you for being here. Come out on Sunday. We have a lot of folks going to be gone Sunday. We're having a cookout Sunday. Memorial Day cookout after the 11 o'clock service. We're going to have a cookout over next door. We've got fresh hamburger. We've got grass-fed Black Angus hamburger meat, yeah. Uh, it's just delivered today. The guy just killed that thing here last week, I guess, and uh, delivered it this morning. And he gave us another fridge. We had a fridge that was out. And so he gave us the fridge, delivered the meat and the fridge, so we'd have a place to keep it. So uh, anyway, hamburger is good. And we'll have some, for the kids, we'll have some hot dogs. And 
if you want to bring something, help yourself. You know, bring a tray or something. I like banana pudding. And, uh, you know, you want to bring something else, that's fine too. But uh, we'll have drinks, we'll have hamburgers, we'll have hot dogs. Uh, we can, you know, we want to get chips and stuff like that. Maybe they don't have to bring anything unless they want something, you know. Uh, hamburgers, all I need. One of them, that's plenty. And we always have all that food left over. But uh, anyway, that's this Sunday, Memorial Day. No Sunday night service, no Sunday evening service. And then Brother Michael will be preaching next Wednesday, and then the following Wednesday and on Sunday. Uh, Sunday week, which is the first Sunday in June, we'll be going to a 1 o'clock evening service. So we'll have 8 o'clock service, 9 o'clock breakfast, 11 o'clock service, and after the 11 o'clock service, around 12. See, the good thing about that, I can preach, I can stop my message, pick it back up again at 1, finish it. So you have to come to hear the, rest, the conclusion. And uh, I'll be doing the afternoon service, and Mike will be doing the Wednesday service. And uh, we're going to encourage everybody on Sundays, June the 5th. Is that what it is? June the 5th? Sunday, June the 5th, to bring you a sandwich. We'll make a crock pot of soup or something next door. And you bring your sandwich, and we'll take a 30 minute, 40 minute break, and come back and have the evening service. Gas, they say it's going to be $10 a gallon before the end of August. And I hope that's not true. Amen. But we have folks who drive 50 miles one way to church on Sunday night. We have folks who drive 15, 25 miles, about 25 miles one way on Sunday night. Jennifer and, and Nick drive, I guess it's about 30 miles from Montrose. One way, 30, do that, 30, 30, that's 60 miles on Sunday night, 60 miles on Sunday morning. And that's 120 miles a Sunday. So... We are thinking about those people who are driving in distances and coming to church on Sunday night, paying right now close to $5 a gallon for gas. And if you're, unless you're driving a diesel, then that's a whole different story altogether. But uh, folks uh, that are watching by YouTube, uh, by live stream, thank you for being with us. God bless you. We're going to check out right now. We're going to have our prayer time together with, it, with our folks. And so uh, see you, I hope, Lord willing, on Sunday morning. God bless. Good night.